Easy E, how are we? We're number one. We're number one. <laughs> We're number one. You're clearly <laughs> in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, if ever I got an ego pet, it was from the Red Bull website. But there's a steward's inquiry. We're actually not number one. We're number two. Number one was the Red Bull podcast. So there has to be Red Bull Give us a million or come on to the podcast and tell me why we're not number one on your platform. But it's been an excellent week all around for us because our athleticism isn't that good. But previous guests of this podcast, Sean, have had one hell of a week. Yeah, we we ran our mouths, but previous guests have been running on the tracks and on the roads and doing absolutely phenomenal. Starting off with um, Caroline Hassett. She is our most downloaded episode. It's a phenomenal episode because she goes through our journey. But this past weekend, she did unbelievable half marathon. Yeah, and those who haven't, do go back and listen to Caroline's episode. It's a great journey of how she goes from getting her shoes on for the first time to running sub three hours. And this week, she ran a 124.10. It's absolutely amazing. She was first place in the 35 plus, second place out of 1,371 women who took part in the race. It is absolutely phenomenal. And then 48th place overall. A true testament to a humble person, not like me, to a humble person <laughs> who really just stays consistent, works hard and just loves it. Well done, Caroline. And, and we really hope you enjoyed your day. A hard run, but no doubt you loved it. Speaking of uplifting things, we got an email from Joanne, her husband, David McAllister, was in the podcast on episode 192. They moved over to Spain back in, I think it was 2017, set up a burrito bar, learned Spanish, and all while doing this, got back into the Ironman game. And he did, not only did he do a marathon, but the very next week he went out and did a 70.3 Ironman. I remember I texted you the time what Duran told me about, and you were very impressed with it. Yeah, like a sub five hour is very impressive, but a sub 440 is very impressive again and it's all fueled by burritos so i am definitely taking the leaf out of his book and absolutely brilliant but not only that to do a marathon in a in a pretty much a pb time the week before and then roll straight into that is is very very impressive and a testament to again hard work dedication but a great guest and those who haven't listened or want to track down the nicest burrito in spain please have a listen back to 192 i'm going even further away from home we have rachel smith Rachel had a great run. She took part as the reigning champion of the Bustleton 100, uh, 100K triathlon race. I didn't think, I knew she was better, but yeah. I did not realize how much she was better. So Rachel won the race once again. She kept her crown as a queen of the triathlon in Bustleton. She beat her own course time by eight minutes, which is phenomenal. It, her her paces, her speed, everything was absolutely amazing. To put it in context, if she stayed the same, the two girls who finished second and third would have both beat her time of last year. So, oh, wow. but the closest competitor to her was five minutes behind. So she went just under the four hours last time round, and she was in around the, the three fifty two this time round. It was absolutely amazing running, amazing cycling, and amazing swimming. And I just need to remind everyone that Rachel, who was a frequent of the podcast, has only got into triathlon over the last three years and world championships coming up this year. We don't put pressure on her, but right now she said she's happy with training. Everything is going right. She's loving training, which is probably the most important thing. And now it's a case of let's see what happens with still eight months to go to the world championships. Speaking of world championships, speaking of Ironman, our next guest in the podcast has experience not only doing Ironman competitions, not only doing phenomenal cycles around this entire country of Ireland, coming back home again, but also announcing on the world stage. We have a phenomenal guest lined up for this week's episode of the podcast. Yeah, this week we have a very special guest. I, I'm starstruck for this one. This is a special one, um, a very, very important guest, the voice of Iron Man and, and has been the voice of many podcasts that people may have listened to. I'm trying not to give away the hint. I'm trying to keep people listening to the click in. <laughs> this is a special podcast for us when a podcaster and a presenter and, and a real star of the show and a voice of sport uh, in Ireland and, of course, around the world and on the world stage of Iron Man. It was nice to be the interviewers to and, and allow Joanne to become the interviewee for once. Well, I'm actually going to go a little bit behind the scenes in this one. I want to tell a quick story before going to this intro of the podcast because 
and uh, Joanne, phenomenal story, talks about all these events. And at one stage, she's talking about Mondello 24. And I didn't want to get selfish and kind of zone in and ask a lot of questions because me and a couple of friends are doing that next month. But at the end of it, we're talking when we wrap up the podcast, hit the stop button on, on the record. We're talking a little bit about the podcast, about different events we're doing, what Eric has lined up, what Joanne has lined up, including the race, which will have just been done over Mallorca. So as this comes out, she will have already done that race. So hopefully she did really well. Um, and she's happy with it. But I was saying I'm doing Mondello. And when she did, when I said that to her, her eyes lit up and she was telling me a ton of tips. Like my hand was going so fast with all the notes. Not only that, she was also hopped on a Zoom call with me the next couple of days later. Uh, bank holiday Monday, actually, at 7 o'clock. She probably had a many more better things to do. But there she is with me and Aaron going through all different tips and helps and everything to to, to put ourselves our best foot forward. And I'm feeling the pressure of doing well with Modelo now because of all the stuff she did for that. And she's probably going to be there as well announcing. So I'm feeling the pressure, but very grateful to her. And, and this is a phenomenal listen. It could go two ways. It could be a very bad thing that she knows your name when you're on that bike, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> it could be done a D all over again, getting awful abuse. The 49ers top on me. <laughs> but uh, but this this is a very special podcast. Um, and it's it's fantastic that it's on a milestone weekend for us to be the number one running podcast. Um, Joanne is very much someone who inspires people about getting into sport and doing the best they can in sport and just enjoying it. And Sean's story is testament to that. She's absolutely amazing as both an athlete and a presenter. And this week's episode is very close to us uh, as, as a great weekend and a, and a top off to a great weekend and a, a testament for what you can achieve if you if you stick at it. And, and this is a great episode for everyone to listen to. And with that said, it's this week's episode of the Any Given Monday podcast. Let's go. So this week on the Any Given Monday podcast, we have international sports announcer, including being the first female announcer at an Ironman World Championships event in 2022 to lead announcer in Kona in 2023. She also has two Irish race records, founder and owner of the Tri Talk and Sport, and was one of Sport for Business' 50 most influential women in Irish sport. Joanne Murphy, welcome to this week's episode of the Any Given Monday podcast. How are you getting on? I'm not too bad. I'm not sure who you're talking about there. It didn't sound like me, but apparently it is. <laughs> Joanne has a whole list of stuff to go through in this one. And the, like, for example, last year, you, you all, your Instagram is like a traveler's guide to all the places you've been and all the places you're announcing from Finland. You're over in, in America a couple of times, Arizona. But I want to go to Galway. September okay. 2011, <laughs> lashing rain, and you are in the back of a van. You've done this, your research. <laughs> <laughs> this, and I didn't even notice until I was doing my research. This was the very first ever Galway Ironman competition. And you were announcing at the stage of T1. So I'm assuming that's when they come out of the pool. I can't imagine how miserable people were coming out of that. And your job was like to announce, to motivate, to inspire. And this is your very first event. Talk us through that. Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. It's great to finally be here. We've been a while trying to get it together between our busy schedules and me off gallivanting, but I'm delighted to be here. It's it's, it's a long story, but it's a short story. So the short and the long of it is that I was invited to MC Ironman 70.3 Galway in 2011. Anybody who raced that event will remember that we had to shorten the swim because the weather in Galway Bay was horrendous. Beautiful day on Saturday gorgeous day on Monday and typical Irish weather. Mother Nature decides that we'll just have to have a white horses in the in the sea. And so I think the swim got shortened. People got hypothermia out on the bike course. It was so cold heading out to Mam Cross. And I had the privilege of being the Irish voice in inverted commas on the at the event, Mike Riley was over from the States, as he did in his time. At that time, he announced every new event, every first edition of an Ironman or an Ironman 70.3. And of course, as we know, Mike Riley is very proud of his Irish heritage and his Irish roots. So he was delighted to come to Galway. So it was my first ever, uh, I suppose, international event. Uh, the, the, the story kind of starts back uh, in the summer of that year when Galway Tri Club were hosting an aquathon. I was the beginners officer. I've been involved in the tri club for a couple of years. I knew loads of people in the club and I was on the Aquathon committee. And about two or three nights before the event, they said, oh, we've nobody to MC it. And I said, ah, sure, look at I'll do it. And if I don't know something about somebody, sure won't I make it up to be grand? You know, we'll have a bit of fun. <laughs> 
luckily enough, Rory Garrity and Owen were the two lo- one of the two of the local guys that were bringing Ironman to Ireland, and they were volunteering at the event for us as well and supporting it. And they heard me, and they were like, "Will you do the Ironman piece?" And I was like. No, what are you on about? Like, I've been training since January. This is August. I'm going doing this race. This is awesome. And then two weeks later, I found out I actually had fractured my pelvis for the first time. Uh, that's a oh, second time is a whole other story. A few years later. And yeah, went back to the boys and said, you know, can I can I do this job? And, and that was it. So that was how I kind of got to the start line of my announcing career through Galway Tri Club. And through Rory and Owen, who are both members of, of the Tri Club still. But that day, coming back to that day with the weather, it was slightly different back there. 2011, we didn't have GDPR. We didn't have, no, social media was kind of picking up a little bit. So I was given free reign with the Facebook page. And I kept contacting people and being in touch with people and posting stuff on Facebook to ask people to send them their stories. And so that I could have the information on the database that when people crossed the line, the information shoots up in front of you. So that's how we know everything. Thing, by the way that's a little insider yeah. that like you know on the database if when people pull in their details we have it set that it comes up in front of us so if you cross the finish line Eric I'll see that it's you know Eric from any given run day podcast or whatever it is that you've told us and so sitting in the back of the van obviously in awe of this whole event like so scared of the whole thing because it is such a huge event to come to Galway and uh, the weather was so bad and we knew so many people as well and there was everyone was under pressure it's the nature of it triathlon everybody's under pressure you've one day to do your thing and you know everybody's training so much for it and so the funny thing of that day was the timing system shot everything from, say, the timing mat at transition into the van up on the laptop. And so there I am going, you know, blah, 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 blah. Brilliant. But the weather was so bad that something happened with the connection. So when they were coming in off the swim, I could get their names and their clubs and all their details. And I sounded like I knew every single person that was racing. And so I sounded awesome. And then when they were coming in off the bike, the timing system went down on my end. So I had no data. I had no names. I had no details, nothing. So I was like, what do I do now? Like, where, where am I allowed to stand in transition? I'm not sure. You know, I don't want to get into trouble. I'm kind of new here. Oh, what do I do? And so in the end, I just said, you know what? I'm going to stand in the middle of T1, T2 as it was, because it was T1 and T2 in the one place. And if somebody comes and gives out to me, well, then I'll just move on. But I'm going out in the middle of the rain and I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but hey ho, let's go. And so that's what I did. I recognized the Galway people. I saw a Wicklow tri suit, a, a Piranha, a Port Marnock, whatever it was. And that's what I did. And I had done lots of research on Galway and Salt Hill at the time. So when it was quiet, I would just talk complete and utter rawish about Salt Hill and Galway and the history of the village and talk general stuff. And kept forgetting that the managing director of Ironman UK at the time was sitting 50 metres away from me and could hear me all day. And that was <laughs> my career, literally. And then obviously on the finish line with Mike Riley, huge privilege, first time ever working the Ironman 70.3 finish line and had so much fun with them. And we built up a fabulous friendship over the past 13 years now. So it was just amazing, a, a lucky a lucky break and a, and a silver lining on a very dark cloud at the time when you think about how injury affects us all and, you know, what I had wanted to do at Ironman Ireland or Ironman 70.3 Ireland and Galway at the time was not what I achieved, but what I did was so much better in the long run. So that is the long, short story to my very first Ironman announcing gig and the rest is history. So we're done now. I can go home. That, that's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely it's kind of like that. <laughs> it's kind of like that proverb. It was like pelvis is broken. Good news, bad news. We'll see. And 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 it has turned out to be an absolutely fabulous career. And and that's where we've seen your podcast over the years, and 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 all the people you've interviewed and and inspired myself and Sean to start talking to some great athletes to get front row seats to inspiring people as you've grown that career you've also maintained yourself as an athlete as well you did recover from those injuries I did yeah so I raced so 2011 kind of was involved in triathlon with the tri club hugely important I'm a big advocate for getting involved in your club whether that's whatever sport it is like giving back to your community is a huge part of what I I enjoy and I embrace and I think so I was involved in the tri club. I ended up as the club chair up to 2015, I think it was 2014, 2015. 
and stayed on the committee and got involved and stayed training and racing, raced a Challenge Roth in 2013, uh, qualified for the World Championships in London in a tie that year as well and raced that year and had a, an absolute ball and then was training for Ironman Austria in 2014 and was involved in a bike crash and came off and fractured my pelvis for the second time. And so... <laughs> Yeah, it's just a bit nuts. But then the silver lining on that cloud was the guy who I was living with at the time, the friend of mine that was living with, we were both doing Ironman Austria. So when he was off doing his four, five, six hour bike rides or his three hour runs, I was like, well, what am I going to do other than get depressed sitting here looking at you going training and I can't do anything. So I started to work on my business and my brand on Try Talking Sport and uh, you know, the time where I should have been training, I was just I, I was working full time as well when I was trying to start building it. You know, and it's very difficult to move from that full time pensionable good job into the completely unknown. And like it really is still an unknown 13 years later. You know, we've kind of I'm not going to say blazed a trail, but I've created this opportunity for myself. And now there's more people coming, male and female, behind me, which is absolutely brilliant. At the time, it was really into the unknown. So so that was really important at the time. And so 2014, couldn't race. 2015, 2016, then a chance opportunity with one of my best friends, Karen Cassidy, who's obsessed with cycling and she's an unbelievable athlete. Race Around Ireland was on. We were sitting in Salt Hill having a cup of coffee and we were tracking the riders in 2016 in August. And she said, geez, we really should do that. And I was like, go away from me. Like, go away. <laughs> not a hope. I am definitely not doing that. You know, I haven't really raced since 2014 or, or, or sorry, 2013 and kind of had like just tipped away doing things, but nothing like a few sportifs and stuff, but nothing really. Uh, actually, I'd done the 6K Sligo swim. That's what I did. I fractured my pelvis, could swim in the pool, had a pull boy and swam. And that's all I could do with swimming. The consultant told me to take up knitting, but I told him I'd poke his eyes out. So I just kept swimming. <laughs> <laughs> like Literally, he did actually tell me to take up knitting and I said, there will be war. <laughs> and so we ended up doing a race around Ireland in 2017, myself and Karen and Marie and Breeds. So four of us together became the Galway Babes. Uh, we had a fantastic team, superb crew. We came second. We were just devastated, like devastated that we came second. We set out to set a new Irish record to win the women's race. And like we're only four ordinary women, like the like the girls are super like, but we are just average women, you know, with jobs and the girls have kids and, you know, just normal life. And we just wanted to prove that if you gave an opportunity to four women um, across the spectrum um, of, of what we do and who we are, that we could just prove that we can do this. And so there was a team from Australia came over, just happened to be the one year they come over and there's another Irish girl on it. And they were super strong. I mean, they beat us by 10 hours. Wow. I, I mean, two and a half thousand kilometers, they beat us by 10 hours. But we set the Irish record because they only had one Irish person on the team. So we were gutted after that. That was August 2017. So we decided to enter the Donegal Ultra 555 and we won that and we won it well. We did 19 hours for the 555 kilometres and it was brilliant. Wow. And as much and all as Race Around Ireland was so tough, it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. And, you know, the friendships that we have out of that still stand the testament of time now and we're really close to the girls and we just have we just have a ball and so that that was like 2017 2018 then I gave up again I was like oh my god I never want to get on my bike you know it was too much we were I was only after setting up coming like I worked in fundraising until the end of 2015 for Enable Ireland and then for the Irish Cancer Society so at the start of 2016 I was really only starting out my own personal journey as a presenter and whatever that would bring no guarantees so like then it was like, oh, she will do race around Ireland. So all my time was spent training and not a lot <laughs> working. So I, I had to kind of pull back a little bit. You do a lot of time interviewing athletes and, and getting to dive into the athlete's life and getting yeah. the pro seat. It'd be rude of us to let you bypass the race around Ireland and not tell us <laughs> what was involved in the training, what was involved oh. on the day. How did you survive the two and a half thousand kilometer race? What's it was, involved in Yeah, it was like... It was just amazing. You know, we started training probably in that we decided we were doing it in that September. And then we started probably training in the November right through until until the race in August. And I actually raced Ironman 70.3 Mallorca 
that year. I'm going back again this year for the first time. <laughs> so absolutely bricking it. Um, <laughs> but Race Around Ireland was amazing. And the key part of it was that we had a team and the team were incredible. The training was insane. We had a super coach. We had a nutritionist. We trained like pros for the, the months ahead of it. Really got stuck into it. We broke the, the team up into two sets of two riders. So Breeds and I would be quite similar. Marie and Karen were quite similar in terms of not only uh, cycling ability, but also in terms of shape as well and size. Size more so than shape, I suppose, because Marie and Breeze or, or Marie and Karen were like super fast, really light, super light and no fear. Myself and Breeze were a little bit stockier, a little bit taller. And that's not being disrespectful to Breed, but we have different strengths. So both of us are really strong on the flat. Breed stronger than me on the hills, but like I'm a demon on the, the flat and the downhill. And so we broke the team up into Karen and Marie and Joanne and Breed. And it also meant that if anything happened, Karen or her bike, she could hop on Marie's bike. And if anything happened, Breed or me, and vice versa, our bike fits, not that they were perfect or the exact same, but in an emergency where we needed it, you could technically use each other's bikes. But if I had been on Karen's bike and and or with Marie, it wouldn't have worked. And so we broke the race down into six hour sessions. So two riders went out on the one on the road, one in the camper, one in the car behind. So they were the live team and the other team were resting in the camper van and being delivered to wherever the meet point was six hours down the road based on what our pace was. And so we switched that out for 80 odd hours. And then in the last, probably the last two hours, then I think it was, I can't remember who actually finished the race. It was probably Karen or Marie because they were the stronger cyclists. It was like 11 o'clock at night on a, I think it was a Wednesday. I can't remember. It was Wednesday. Yeah, it was Wednesday. Cycling into to Mead, finishing it. And it was, it was just, it was insane. Like it, it was it was so hard. Like it was just, you just couldn't stop. And no matter what you did to train for it, you never could have done enough for it because you never could have practiced properly what it was like. We did half an hour on, half an hour off in within the six hours. So you were averaging up between 16 to 19 kilometers for that half an hour. Like that's kind of the pace you were going at zone three, zone four. You couldn't go into zone five. You couldn't go too much into zone four because you had to get back on the bike again. So you were trying to manage your rest, recovery, fueling, didn't eat on the bike, eat in the car, you're getting soaking wet, you have to change, full change of clothes in the back of the car. Where do you go to the toilet? You know where to go to the loo. Like there's no stopping. Like it was just mad, but it was just brilliant. Like and the camaraderie out on the course from the other riders and the crew and then worrying about getting penalties and, you know, watching the tracker for everybody else and the support we got from so many people around, like outside of our own personal circles was just amazing and yeah it was it was it was so hard I will never forget being down in Kerry and my stomach had taken a really bad turn and I don't want to turn your listeners off but let's just say that nothing nothing was staying in my system and we were on the ring of Kerry so I think I had to go and do my next six hour stint in around Kenmare and somewhere and I think we finished somewhere near Skibbereen. Would that be right? I can't even remember. But it was her, like her, I don't know how I cycled. I really don't know how I cycled, but it was so hard. And then the relief of knowing, I think I think we finished one stint. Did we do Skibbereen or Kinsale or something? And we came close to where my family home was in Cork. And by the time we got out to Blackpool, where we turned over, we were nearly at the end, but we were still only in Cork and still had to get all the way to Wicklow. But it was like, oh, we're nearly done now. We're going to finish. With <laughs> we're going to finish in the next 24 hours like we're nearly done. You know, so it was just you kind of you, you forget about it a little bit, but it was it was amazing. It was so good. And then Donegal was just like a blast. Donegal was like a half day. <laughs> Donegal was 555 kilometers just so people are having to remember that yeah but it was 19 hours and 20 something minutes and we still had the same strategy for that but at the end what we did is we didn't sleep as much we had I think we had two rotations each of the six hours and then for the last four hours they put us together so it depended on was it a downhill was it an uphill you know we had done lots of preparation on the course we'd actually gone to Donegal and wrecked it 
and we, we the route book obviously so we knew like if it was going to be a really hard climb it would have to be Karen or Marie going up if it was going to be a flat rolly road and wide road where I could just go down and hammer it then that and if it was only for 15 minutes then that's all I was getting off that because it might go into a climb or it might be some other bit of terrain so yeah it was just it was just brilliant it was brilliant but I've done Mondello since as well which is another you know Donegal Race Around Ireland is, is still not back post-COVID Donegal Super Race highly recommend it to anybody and they've added like a 333 as well and they've added an unsupported version so it, it opens up lots of opportunities for people and so then obviously COVID hit then kind of late after that was that 20 took a break then and COVID hit going back to my own journey in sport and so then I started Zwifting like a demon because you could do nothing but go Zwifting and stay within your 5k radius but we built up a lovely community of people on their bikes and we were racing with RWB and then coming out of the back of that I ended up working with the team from Mondello and of course Karen is the solo champion of Mondello 24. So I crewed for her, but worked for Mondello as the race announcer. And the following the year then in 22, ended up on the Women's Commission team. And then last year did the the, the Connacht Cycling team. We actually set a team up from Cycling Connacht from the province. And it was just brilliant getting the opportunity to be part of the action, but yet announce it and just see like the the variety of cyclists and ability that was there. And to see that team come together from across the province and and lots of us don't road race like I definitely don't road race I would much prefer a time trial or an ultra spin I just I'm fearful of getting knocked off my bike in a in a road race and and so this was just a perfect opportunity and I'm back again this year so I'm really looking forward to that not on the bike at the moment unless somebody loses a teammate and I'll happily hop on as long as I <laughs> as long as I make it through Mallorca in one piece in in two weeks but yeah that's kind of it and just during COVID kept up a bit of swimming, did a bit of open water swimming and then fell in love with gravel biking. So I kind of go through fads, but I guess the cycling has been the main thing. I did a sprint triathlon last year in La Coutre, decided on the Friday I would test and see if I could swim 750 metres in my wetsuit and I could and my race suit fit. So I said, OK, I'll do La Coutre tomorrow. And that's what I did. <laughs> so I go back to the work as a team and group next month is Mondello, but by the time this comes, maybe next month. And, and you've done that. I know you've done teams and stuff before. For people listening that are like, you know what, Race Around Ireland's not back yet, but I'm probably not doing, you know, 2,200 or, you know, 2,500 kilometers and they want to do a team for Mondello. Um, what advice would you have for them based on your experience doing it in the past? Oh, like definitely the key thing isn't actually the cycling. If you're doing a team, if you're on a team of four and eight, the key thing isn't actually the cycling. You can do the cycling. It's actually the resting, refueling and recovering between the stints. So as an eight person team, you really only cycle for three hours because it's, it's, uh, is it three? Is that right? Yeah. Six yeah. Half an hour stints. And so you're hammering it around the track for the 30 minutes. That's what you're doing. If you're if you're on a team where you want to do well or you want to give a good account for yourself, you're going to hammer it. Well, I know I hammered it. As much as I was able to, I was post-COVID in, in 2022, so I was a little bit nervous about my physical ability um, and just not pushing too hard. And then last year, just hammered it. And so that would be the big thing, that you get off your feet, your fuel properly, that you're, fu- that you're warming up properly so if you're only doing a half an hour only half an hour at a stint that you're actually on a turbo for 20 minutes or 15 minutes before you get on and that you're putting a few little sharp short efforts into that but that you're not completely going into the red that you can't get back on the bike again Um, and the hardest part is actually managing the fatigue and the sleep overnight and bring a comfortable chair that you can lie back on you know they have them in home store and more done stores those uh, weightless chairs you can sit back in and (laughs) Just bring plenty of food and gear and have the crack. Like that's the main thing about Mandela. That's what's so special about it is teams of people come together and and it's people who don't necessarily know each other. You know, I know there's a, there's a couple of gyms come. I know Mick, Mick Kyo had a group there. Number One Fitness had a group and they knew each other, but they didn't really know each other. Some of them, you're all together in the pit. You're having fun. You're learning what, what they're doing. You're looking at their strategy. You're seeing what people are eating. The first year we were there, people had washing machines. Now it was October. They had a washing machine, a tumble dryer to dry the kit. You don't need 17 pairs of shorts. You need good lights for your bike for nighttime. You need a pair of long leggings. You need probably three pairs of shorts and some baby wipes. It sounds disgusting, but like, hello, we're athletes. You know, um, it's 24 hours. Change your shorts a couple of times. Like, don't go bananas. But that would be it. And just embrace it it is so safe and enjoyable and the team put on a a great event and 
I I think for me what Mondello does is it it opens the doors for people to dip their toes into ultra cycling. And we don't have an awful lot of ultra cycling opportunities. Like we we have Mondello, we have the Joe Bar series, and we have a uh, Horik Mary with his Wild Mayo events out in, in Westport. They're the three major unless I'm forgetting somebody and apologies if I do, but I'm sorry, obviously Donegal Ultra as well. They, they're the four big events in the country at the moment for ultra cycling. They're all on the road. You have to navigate, you have to do routes, logi- a lot more logistics than you do when all you're doing is cycling around the track. Mm. Cycling is the easy bit when you're ultra cycling out on a route and of course the cycling is the easy bit. It's everything else around it that's hard. So that would be my advice. Have some fun. Listen to the podcast on Mondello. Uh, from 2021 with Karen and 2022 with our Women's Commission team. And if anybody's listening and they want to reach out and they're doing Mandela, just pop me a message. I'll happily give them some advice. And what we'll do is we'll link in those two episodes in our show notes. So people who are thinking of doing it or even for charity, you know, a lot of people get involved for it. it's charity gig. Friends and family get together to just take part on a on a monumental scale. Uh, and, and it is something, it's not just for the, the professionals. It's not just for those who are looking to win. It's for those who want to try something new as a team, as a group and, and push themselves. No different to an ultra marathon, a backyard ultra, all these things that are starting to show up. It's uh, It sounds like an absolutely fantastic event. Of all the sports, obviously cycling seems to be your preferred one. Haven't had the front row seats to triathlon clubs and now Ironman. Have you worked on any of the others or which one would you say is the one that lets you down? Oh, do you know what? It's hard to know. I absolutely love cycling. I love the speed. I, I, I enjoy cycling. I enjoy, I actually really enjoy the turbo on Zwift now as well. I enjoy absolutely killing myself, as my mother says. She says there's a drug for that, you know, that you don't need. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I keep hearing from her. I've been training since 17 weeks now, to, um, starting training for Mallorca. She says, I'm sure there's a drug you can take for that. Um, <laughs> she's the biggest supporter of all, you know, but you know the way mammies get scared when you're out on the bike. Um, I, I don't really know. I think probably 17 weeks ago, I would have said my run, but actually I think it's probably my swim. My run has come on quite a bit. Obviously, struggle a little bit with my left hamstring because of my hip and maybe it's just psychological that it hurts a little bit more sometimes than the other one and and obviously as 90% of the population have that are cyclists or triathletes we all have one weaker glute than the other mine happens to be my left so it gives me a bit of jip but I just love the cycling I love the freedom of it I think that's what it is and and even if you look at the gravel cycling Going out on the road bike is one thing. You're always looking at your pace and your time and, oh, my Strava, Queen of the Mountain, or my local legend, or did Karen beat me this week, or did I beat her, or no, I rarely beat her. Let's just, <laughs> let's just be clear, I rarely beat Karen. Maybe today, going up a hill once, because uh, she might have been in the wrong gear, but that's about it. But the gravel cycling as well, I think what it allows for is it's that slower pace, a bit more relaxed, and it's kind of, uh, it just you're not racing to the next thing. It's like, well, I my bike is heavy and I'm heavy and I'm just going to pedal as fast as I can, How slow, however slow that is, to the top of this mountain. And I'm going to enjoy it. And I think it's just a different vibe. It's like I was in Croatia last week, so for the Four Islands mountain bike race, and it's owned by Ironman. It's part of the Epic series, but it's completely different to turning up to work at an Ironman event where the athletes are focused on it's one day. It's been six, nine, 12 months of, of hard graft, whether it's a 70.3 or a, a full distance Ironman, whether it's a first or a 21st race, it's very, very focused. There's a lot of testosterone. There's a lot of anticipation, a lot of nervousness. The mountain bike race was five events over four islands. So it was a prologue on Tuesday and then we raced four different stages Wednesday to Saturday. You had you had so many different chances to prove yourself and to get your points and to do whatever that it was just completely different. And the vibe is different again with mountain bikers than it is with triathletes or road cyclists, you know. So yeah, cycling. I don't know where I went to that answer, but cycling is probably my favorite at the moment. It's still my favorite. The sea, I still kind of like it. I get a little bit nervous. I'm kind of nervous about Majorca, but I'll be fine. And then the bike. The sea monsters are real. I'm yeah, I oh, they that. are. They are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just need to get on some fast toes. Not too fast, though. And then the run course. Yeah, I've kind of gotten a bit of confidence in my run. I've been consistent with my running. And yeah, I've just put some numbers down that I'm kind of like, okay, if my stomach can hold out, then hopefully I'll get to the finish line in Mallorca. 
It's all the stuff that's out of my control now that's going to stop me in Mallorca. That's what I said to somebody today. Everything, the boxes are ticked. Everything is done. Do you feel an extra pressure, obviously being the voice of Iron Man, the Irish voice of Iron Man, and now you're, you're in the, 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 when you cross a transition line, your name pops up with a large CV of information. Are you a little bit nervous of your colleagues no. knowing that you're doing it or does it add any pressure? I, I actually think it's kind of going to be part of the motivation I had a conversation with somebody about this recently, actually, about somebody else. And they were saying, you know, they individually didn't like the race they were in where it was really busy. They wanted to be unknown down the corner, running where it was quiet, whereas this other athlete embraced all the noise and wanted the shouts. I think I'm going to want the shouts. I think I'm going to need them. I don't think it adds more pressure. I've I've. I think it probably will spur me on a bit. I've been very open about my training and kind of wasn't sure whether I would... I suppose diary it, which is what I've done on my socials um, every week since I started training. And I think it was the 30th of December, I rejoined um, the local gym and went for a swim. And that was the start of the first day of, of training for the race. Um, plus there's a lovely group of us from Galway doing it. And there's a team from Ironman UK doing it as well. Some of the Irish gang are doing it from Ironman, some of the English gang or the UK gang. So there's great banter and competitive spirit. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say it's more competitive than it is banter. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few people with sneaky training, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I've been a total open book with my training. It's all over Strava. It's on the socials. I've shown some of the ugly sides of it, the hard sides, the 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 fear definitely was mounting after being in Croatia last week. And I had a bit of a tummy bug or something when I was away. So I thought I'd get some running and swimming done. The the type of, of movement that we were doing around the place didn't facilitate any swimming. My stomach didn't facilitate any running other than one short run on the Tuesday and a, a longer 7K, which was my long run for the week. So I kind of came home a little bit like, oh, my God, we're three weeks out from the race. What am I going to do? I'm not going to be able for this to putting in I think I did a 12 13 hour week of training this week so I'm like I'm ready now I just I just want it to be done tomorrow <laughs> you you also had a bit of training in, in Lanzarote for this one as well was it yeah yeah so, so, I'm not feeling too sorry for you now you're, you're training in Croatia <laughs> and I saw the weather in your, your pics over there <laughs> you're over in Lanzarote for 10 11 days oh, training no. there Joanne you're not getting sympathy on this one <laughs> well I'm not looking for sympathy I'm not just thinking, <laughs> right so I mean so I'm very goal orientated and I'll be the first of it. I'm really competitive. Mm. I know I'm not a good athlete, but I'm competitive. And all I want to do is get the best out of myself. And and for all the work I've put in, I just want to have a good result. Like my best result in Mallorca was a 5.59. I think my worst was a 6.21. If I finish in seven hours, it doesn't matter. It's I've I've done all the work. I've done all that I can do at this point in time, seven years later with, what I have in available to me to do it. And so when we got to the end of last year, it was a crazy year last year. You you know, you've seen it. Very privileged to be part of the Ironman team, to get to travel to Finland, to Nice, to the UK, to Hawaii, to Arizona, wherever, you know, loads of places. But by the time we got to December, I was exhausted. And so I didn't really get a break. And I'm I'm not complaining. I'm not saying that at all. But I don't work a nine to five Monday to Friday. So my my 40 hours can be like a Friday to Sunday. You know, I could work 40 hours from Friday to Sunday and still have to get up on Monday morning to do an award ceremony and then travel home. And travel is part of the working time almost sometimes. So when I saw then that uh, I definitely was taking January off, that was a decision I made. I wasn't going to work in January. There was no announcing. I was not traveling unless it was to Lanzarote to go up training. And and then February and March were light on the public workload. You know, I wasn't presenting that much, but there's lots of logistics and lots of stuff going on behind the scenes that I do. And so I was like, if I don't have something to train for, I am not going to train. I'm going to be the size of a house and I'm just going to eat my way through the winter. And this is not good. And I really wanted to do something significant. And for me, the Ironman 70.3 was significant. Not saying that a sprint or an Olympic distance race isn't significant or 5K because it's significant depending on who you are and where you are. But for me, I needed a big goal. I needed a scary goal. And Mallorca is kind of scary. So that's 
That's what I'm at. Yeah. And, so and, and so I had to go to Lanzarote then as well. Sure. <laughs> I couldn't let Oliver and Paddy off to Lanzarote on their own. I had to go over and whip them into shape. Two two statements. Obviously, when you do events like Race Around Ireland, like this. You do need to pick events that scare you. That's the only thing that's going to keep you interested. And and for us who have done a couple of marathons now, okay, a 5K is scary because it's max effort. And I I don't like them personally. Mm. I choose a marathon over a 5K any day. But when you choose these events, the half Ironman, Ironman, and it still scares you now, is it because you're aiming for that time? Is it because of it is the one day event? You have seen so many people compete in Ironman and, and riding on that one day. Is that part of the element of 16 weeks for one day? Is that part of the scare factor? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I said to Karen today on, on the way home, I said like everything it that is out of my control now is is going to be the hardest part of the day. So if I get a puncture, will I be able to fix it? Am I going to put the foam into the, my tires now? Do I put? Do I go messing and put foam in the back of my tires? If I get a puncture, the tires are going to be heavier going up the climb, but there's going to be foam in them. So don't need to worry about a puncture. Or do I just leave well enough alone? The bike's been serviced. He's perfect. I love him, Freddie. <laughs> Freddie felt. Do I go messing with them? Do I need the extra weight going up the hill? Absolutely no way. If I get a puncture, will I be able to fix it? Yes, I could at a push. Will it cost me an hour? It could. But is that just the nature of the game? Then that's what happens. I can't control how my stomach is going to react. I can't control how I'll go up the hill or what the heat's going to be like on the day. It's going to be a hard slog for 45 minutes. But then hopefully the wind will play ball and I'll have a lovely tailwind all the way back into town, down away bars, 40 kilometres an hour, happy days. If not, it'll be a hard slog at 22 kilometres an hour and I will fall in cross transition four hours off the bike, um, <laughs> which I hope doesn't happen. And then, but then on the run course, I can't control how my stomach is going to react or will my hamstring go? So I think to answer your question, I think it's the fact that I've put, you put all your eggs in this one basket and I don't have an opportunity to race another 70.3 later in the year because whilst I've taken January, February, March easy and gallivanted around the place from a, a public announcing perspective and, and not worked as much as I will be from after Ironman 70.3 Mallorca, it is game on. There is like, it's chaos. Like literally I get home on the Thursday after the race and I'm straight into a gymnastics gig. I'm then out in La Coutra and then hosting a conference for Sport Ireland and then I'm flying to Zurich. And that's two weeks. In a space of two weeks, I'm in, is it five or six different events in three different counties and two different countries? <laughs> you know, and, and then it just progresses for the rest of the season, the whole way right through to the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th of December. Like earlier on, you mentioned, you, you mentioned Finland, Wales, Nice and all that. They're like, well, that's a hell of a year. But that was really four or five months to you. That, that was the end of the, the end year. How do you... You're, you're sitting down, you, you've got your own brand, you're, you're, you're maybe editing for Try Talking Sport and all the rest, but you know you've got a run to or a cycle to do. How do you separate your time to go, or like if you're like in that zone doing all the work and stuff, and, but then you know in the back of your mind, I need to get the cycle in. Do you do you have a coach that's on you? Are you self-coached? to? And how do you do, do sort out your time to do something like that? So I don't, I don't have particularly have a coach. I downloaded a beginner's program, this beginner's program and downloaded the intermediate program. And I picked and chose, picked and choose or pick and chose my sessions, depending on if it was a bike course, I knew I could go harder on a bike than on a beginner plan. If it was run, I definitely was on a beginner. If it was swim, I could mix between the two. Didn't do a huge amount of swimming for this, this, this race. And then I've got really good people around me here, but then also Oliver Harkin has been keeping an eye on me. So gave him access to my training peaks and he checks in every so often or when I came home from Croatia I just said to him help what am I doing for the next three weeks what's the key session I need to get done and just tell me and I'll do it and if you know when I did it the last time we did have a coach because the coach that we had was coaching us for race around Ireland so it was very different so just to come back to your question about I suppose penciling in the time mm. I had to turn around and treat my training like work so if I needed to get, so Friday, I was adamant. I was doing my metric 70.3. I was going to be gone into the pool for eight o'clock in the morning. I was going to be going out on my bike for two to two and a half hours. And then I had to run for an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how long I was running. Friday was gone. Like there was no meetings in the book. There was any work that had to be done was done Thursday or yesterday. And that was something that I actually, you talk about having a front row seat to triathletes and great minds. 
So it was a triathlete in South Africa who told me, who was working full time, racing full time, doing very, very well, said that if she has to go on her bike at 11 o'clock, she puts her pencil down at 11 o'clock, she closes her laptop, she goes and she does her session. She treats it just like any other meeting of the day and that you just had to be disciplined because otherwise what happens is you continue working on podcast editing or writing a press release or doing somebody's socials or whatever it is. And suddenly it's quarter past 11 and then your next meeting is at one o'clock. So there goes your hour and a half of a training session is now out the window because you can't do it because you've just left yourself short by 15, 20 minutes or whatever it is. So that was something that I really focused on. And actually every single Monday, whether I was in the country or not, I have my little book and I write Monday and the date at the top. And on the bottom, I have a little, um, I just break the bottom of the page. Sounds really rudimentary, but I break the bottom of the page up into the seven days of the week. And I just pop in swim or bike or run or swim or bike or whatever it is. And then my meetings just very quickly of like where I am kind of everything's in Google Map, Google Calendar anyway but that's kind of what I've done you just have to be disciplined you know yourselves from running marathons and and doing sport anyway you, you have to be disciplined if I could just be disciplined about my food I could actually be a pro athlete but I can't <laughs> the only discipline I have with food is that if I see food I will eat it yeah food <laughs> Food is definitely my kryptonite as well, but I wouldn't <laughs> say I'd be a professional athlete if it wasn't for it. Though, be <laughs> well, no, actually, to be fair, we did a lot of training in Lanzarote the first week. I did 25 hours of training and I could not wait to stop. <laughs> I will never make it as a pro athlete. No way. Yeah, sorry, Juan, you were going to ask me something. It is a different level of commitment. And again, we go back from your, your training career into the, the thoughts. Like even the likes of the diary is a little tip people can take away. When you when you physically write something down, it's like making a contract with yourself because our our weeks are populated by other people. You know, can we schedule a meeting for this time? That's even the likes of us trying to hound you for a meeting. When you actually write down the plan, I always find that the written plan is more of a contract because you've said, okay, I'm doing this and it'll register in the brain when someone tries to nab you for that 15 minutes. Now, if something else on, I don't know what it is. Oh, it's a cycle, I'll go cycling. Do you find those little tricks and those little nuggets? Because we all know motivation lasts for a week <laughs> and then you're 15 weeks of training left. Are there other any nuggets that you've seen athletes doing or, or that, again, you've used yourself that can take people beyond motivation? I suppose it's just kind of having a bit of self-belief as well. And actually, when you start doing the training and you start to see things getting better, you're kind of get motivated yourself and also having the people around you. Like I've been so lucky. I'm a member of Galway Tri Club and I've had, you know, Karen, I've been cycling with Karen and with Eve. We have we had a Zwift league going on where we were racing Zwift with gangs from the UK across uh, Scotland, Wales and England. And we had to do, I think, was it five Zwift races, two 5Ks in real life and a 750 real swim in the pool. And so that kind of kept me motivated as well because we had this WhatsApp group. We were Team Galway Tri Club and we were on it that we were like not going to let the side down. We were all training really Really hard. If I hadn't been doing Mallorca, probably would have been just focused on doing really well for that in my own capability, my own level of, of ability. So that definitely helped like the, the suffering together. And then I have a really good friend, Jane, who brought me running every week. Like running was my Achilles heel. I just was like, oh my God, how am I going to run? We always run from Dangan because there was a toilet there. I get to 5k and I'd be like, I should go to the toilet. This isn't fair. I can't <laughs> run. And so but, but this is but this is the way it is. And so then you kind of are like, OK, well, what did I do or what did I eat? Why do I need to do this? And then she's there saying, Murph, come on, hit the numbers, stop slowing down or slow down. Murph, you're going too fast. You know, I might give her the session or she might go out for half an hour before me and then I'd meet her and then she might do her, her session. But I I always knew there was somebody there. And oh, and the big thing as well, I think if you're if you're not in a club, it's very hard to go out and do sessions on your own. Like today I was going to do the hills. Now I'm tired, but I was going to do the hills and the girls are on about meeting me today. And I was like, no, 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 I need to do the hills on my own. Leave me alone. I need to go do them on my own. Psychologically, you got to do the 100K on your own. You got to do your long run on your own at least once before the race. And anyway, didn't they, they knew where I was going. So they came along and well, we hammered it. <laughs> like I tell you now, Brilliant. we hammered it. And there's no, and I was going to do just four hill reps on this hill. And I was like, oh, God, I'd never have done it. And actually, we changed the session completely. And I had a much better confidence boosting session 
because I cycled with the two girls, we hammered it up one side of the hill, hammered it down, went out and did a hammer of an interval around a new road, came back up and hammered it up and down the hill again from the other side. And I went home. That was it. An hour and a half done. Hit all the numbers that I wanted to hit psychologically and wouldn't have hammered it as hard as I did up the hills if I hadn't had the girls with me. Brilliant. And, and let's face it, in a race, you're never really alone. OK, you're not drafting. No, you're, no. you're not talking, but you you have people in sight that you can latch onto, or you can you can be chased by or pushed by, and it, it, you know essentially it's if the girls are chasing you and pushing it, you will have that same factor on the it day. It's more like me chasing them. So and <laughs> the, funny thing, the funny thing going up the hill was like I was like, lads, I'm definitely not going this hard up the mountain in Mallorca. Race, <laughs> steady swim, steady bike, and then the that's the plan: steady swim, steady bike. And a, a nice run. And if I have it in the end, I'll push the run at the end if, if the stomach and the legs permit. But that's that's the plan. And if I get to the finish line, brilliant. I just want to be able to dance at the after party. <laughs> <laughs> Switching gears a little bit from your training, Joanne. I, I was over in uh, Portugal last October to see Eric do the Ironman. And I, I can't swim in open water. I can't swim full stop, let alone open water. I'm not too mad in the bike. Running's my thing. I like my two feet in the ground. But like 10 minutes before the start of, of Eric doing the Ironman, you know, he's heading down the hill towards the start and the lead announcer is talking and, the top, and Hans Zimmer's gladiators playing in the background. And for a couple of seconds, like my fiance had to look at me go, don't even think about it. We're not coming <laughs> back next year for you to do it. And I, but I, I felt that like, even now I'm, I'm starting to get like the goosebumps back of my neck, the, the hair is thinking, thinking about it. Like, but you did that, like no offense to Portugal, but it's not Kona. It's, it's not Hawaii. It's not the world championships. But you did that last year. That's like, like did, did you feel nervous knowing how like, people's training and everything just to try and get to this moment? Like people can do Ironman, but to get to Hawaii, like how, how are you feeling before that? And how did, like, how do you prep for that? It's very hard, very different. And like Paul, Paul is, was the announcer in Kashkaish. I've heard the the speech he did. It's um, like he is such a great speaker. I, you know, he's amazing. The emotion and the words that he can put together. He's just a master storyteller. I'm nowhere near as good as him at that. I suppose I have a kind of a different style. Hawaii is different again. It's a world championship. The eyes of the world are on you. It's slightly different. You know, you don't really have the time for that final inspirational, motivational piece. You kind of are doing that in the days leading up to it around the banquets and stuff like that. Like everything is is fairly tight timing wise and everything. But Hawaii was, oh God, it was just, it was insane. Like it was just such a privilege. You know, I, I suppose when I went to Utah in 2022, I was a member of the team. Mike was number one, Paul was number two, and I was somewhere three, four, whatever. It didn't really matter. Like I was just a member of the team, very grateful to be there. And then with Mike retiring in October of 2022 um, and the women's race going to Kona, it was like as if that little silver lining on that lucky cloud that was around in 2011 kind of came back and stitched it back up that suddenly I would be the lead announcer in Kona the very first year after Mike Riley retires, because really it should have been Paul. You know, if on a normal year, if the in a previous year, if this the races hadn't been split, you know, Paul would have been the lead announcer. And then it was just it was just insane, you know, that the pressure from my own perspective, my own I've said I'm competitive, but like I put so much internal pressure on myself as well to be the best that I can be for myself, but also to be that I the best that I can be because so many people have supported me getting to where I am and here I am on this elevated pedestal in front of the world with the world's best female athletes about to chase a world championship whether they're the pros or whether they're the age groupers however they got there like this is this is unreal like this is amazing for everybody and so as an event for Ironman it had to work because obviously there'd been a lot of backlash about the split and you know, it worked. It really did work. Kona was amazing. All the feedback we got from the athletes was that it was real. It was lovely. The girls were lovely to each other. There was loads of men there as well. Don't get me wrong. The men were amazing supporting the athletes. We had lots of men on the team. It was, just, it was a different vibe to the previous year, which had been a double whammy. And then a different vibe again, obviously, because the previous year it had been both uh, male and female. In terms of prep, 
it's really hard to comp- to tell you what I had to do. I knew probably, I think it was before Finland, that I was going to be the lead announcer in Kona and that Paul would be my support. And then I wasn't meant to be in Nice, but things changed and I ended up in Nice for a few days. Um, but I had a family commitment. By the time it got round to being booked for Nice, I had a family commitment. And so I came home early. But when I, when I thought a lead announcer and I thought of what Mike did, I thought, oh yeah, I'll anchor the banquet, the welcome banquet, anchor the post-race banquet. I'll probably be on the pier for race day and say go. And I'll probably call the champion down the finish line. I did not expect to be lead announcer in the sense of I hosted the Monday night, Tuesday night, the Wednesday (laughs) night, the press conference, pre-event, post-event, the volunteer party, everything. Like it was just, it was yeah, it was it was just amazing. But I, I never comprehended that I would do so much. I thought that they would split it a bit more equally between myself and Paul, with the exception of the key parts as the lead female for the female race. So that was that was a big rude awakening when I landed kind of like, oh, holy God. Oh, my God. Mike <laughs> has done this for 30 odd years. How how am I going to do this? Like, he's not even here to tell me how we do it. You know, um, so so that was interesting, but everybody was amazing and so supportive. And we had a great team of announcers and we had a great team on the World Champs team. And then the athletes are so supportive as well. And, you know, I was on breakfast with Bob. I mean, I totally made it, you know, on breakfast with Bob. <laughs> Never thought I'd be on breakfast with Bob. And that was great crack. And then he was on the podcast, hit my, my, own, my own podcast. But like everything from with Ironman World Champs, you've got the the Hall of Fame, you've got the athletes who've been around for a long time who are, you know, the six-time Ironman world champions, the the Mark Allens, the McKeely Jones, you had Greg Welsh, you've Craig Crowe, you've Rinny, you've you've loads of these people. And you can't know everything about everybody, but you have to know a certain amount about all of those, plus all of our current amazing professional athletes who are have been around for a little while and those that are coming through as well and being able to to learn it's like studying for the leave insert and trying to get the tone and the vibe right and and everything it was it was yeah it was mad race day was easy it was in terms of it was easy in the sense of you were doing what you do all the time it was the other bits maybe that were a little bit more daunting because they were stuff you'd never done before you know when you do something once or you've seen somebody do it and then you do it yourself. You're like, ah, oh, that's mm. what it was. But yeah, I mean, like calling Lucy Charles Barkley down the finish line. Oh, my word. Like I, I, I have goosebumps. <laughs> I've actually got goosebumps. Like it was wow. just the biggest privilege to be in Hawaii, ultimately. And to have that opportunity was huge. I don't take it lightly. You know, when I think back to Ironman 70.3 Galway in 2011, did I ever think I'd get to Kona? Not sure I did. Did I put it on my bucket list as something that I really, really wanted to achieve? 100%. Do I know what I'm going to do next? What's the next big bucket list? Haven't a clue. The focus was so much on Kona for so long of like getting to Kona and being on the finish line, never mind being the lead announcer. I never, ever thought I would be the lead announcer. So it's like, what do you do next? Okay, let's let's do 2024 and see what happens. Obviously, the Olympics are on this year. I'm not going to the Olympics. Um, That doesn't mean I don't have my my eyes on the Olympics for, you know, LA or beyond. Um, But I was wondering why you took out your notebook there and wrote Olympics down. (laughs) (laughs) I've written on the wall, yeah. So, yeah, I've been, yeah, I've been really privileged uh, to be, to have the team. And, you know, I think sometimes as well, people forget that all somebody needs is that little opportunity. So when you think of, the the distraught feeling I had when I heard I had a fractured pelvis and then the little pin of hope that I got when Aria, come on, do do Ironman Ireland 70.3 back in 2011. And so then little windows started to open along the way. And then there was times where there weren't any windows or any doors and you kind of create the opportunity. So I could have not had a podcast. Now I have a podcast. The podcast opens doors for me. I get to interview lots of people front row seat as you say you say yourselves but what it's also done is it opens opportunities 
beyond triathlon, beyond Ironman, to be a presenter or a host of other events and to interview other people. You know, I interviewed um, Dame Kelly Holmes uh, while I was in Lanzarote. It wasn't all training. I did actually do a bit of work. Um, but, you know, like, when do you ever get to interview Dame Kelly Holmes? I mean, incredible athlete, history maker, history breaker. Amazing. You know, so I think sometimes as well, and and at the moment, there's a lot of instant gratification stuff going on and it's all, a lot of it is take, 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 take and we take everything. But I think we have to give back as well and we have to look at the opportunities to open the doors for other people coming through in whatever that is, wherever that is. And I've probably gone off on a tangent here now, but I suppose what I'm trying to say is I'm so grateful for all the support I've been given, not just by Ironman, but by the athletes, by the likes of yourselves that are having me on your podcast to share my story. You know, that all helps with supporting somebody like me who 13 years ago didn't know where they were going to go or what they were going to do or would this actually work and look where we are now, you know. So, um, yeah, it's a bit mad. It's a bit mad. But the journey is not without little bit of a rolly road, a few hills, a few mountains, a few lovely descents, flying it, and then you hit a roadblock like COVID. And then it's like, oh, what do we do now? And then you come out of it and suddenly you're pedaling again and off you go. And look, I've been lucky. I haven't had too many punctures along the way since COVID. <laughs> and, yeah, and to give you credit, you're very modest in what you say, but look in a lot of times is hard work meeting opportunity and and you work so hard we we understand and well sean understands i don't do anything for this podcast but sean understands the effort goes into the the editing the the research the 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 different elements that goes into what it is that you've created and and a great brand and and from being in finland and from listening to you the feedback of just hearing an Irish voice at the start line of a, a 70.3 world championship was one of the most spectacular feelings there was fog on the water I just heard Joanne's voice welcoming everyone and, and getting them ready for the day. And there was a couple of little things like delays and all of that kind of things. And we were starting to don the Irish flags like, yes, we have an announcer. We're going to do great to say so. <laughs> that, that feeling that you give for an Irish athlete through your podcast, through the Ironman, is so special. And you do it so flawlessly and so effortlessly. So you call it luck and others who are looking at you think, it's been absolutely amazing to be a part of events, to be at events that you're there. Um, you're so welcoming. And Ironman are lucky to have you. And that's what we think. Um, and we're we're very supportive of it. But if anyone has ever an interest in going to not do an Ironman, but watch an Ironman, make sure Joanne is there because it is mm. one of the best experiences. It is a show. And Sean got to witness one in Portugal. I got to witness you in, in Finland, in Lati. And it was just amazing to see what you've done. And we're excited to see how far you can go as well. What what the next thing on your bucket list is, Joanne, but by all means, you definitely have worked hard enough to be there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's sometimes you kind of forget that like you're working for the biggest endurance sports company in the world. I'm contracted in, I'm not an employee. I'm working with them and for them. But I've come from this small little place in the corner of Ireland, down in the middle of nowhere in County Cork, in case you didn't realise my Cork accent. Um, <laughs> and then suddenly you were on the world's biggest stage in Hawaii. And what really struck me was somebody messaged me on the Sunday after Kona saying, well done, super job, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And the key thing that stuck at me was every time that piece of VT is played of Lucy Charles Barclay running down the finish line, it's going to be her voice. And I suddenly went... Oh my God. What have, yeah. oh my God. Oh, wow. This actually, this was, this actually happened. Cause you kind of forget, like, we punch way above our weight as a nation in terms of what we achieve in sport and beyond. Um, and sometimes you just have to take a step outside the box and go, oh, so I, it's just my job. I do it. I love it. I love meeting all the athletes. I love having the crack. I don't love the two o'clock in the morning or the three o'clock in the morning starts, but I do love the final hour of racing. And I love the, the adrenaline pumping and my heart rate goes through the roof about four minutes before we play the national anthem at the start of a race and the timings and everything that we have to do. My heart rate, I get the abnormal alert. I get a sharp intake of breath and I'm like... <gasps> my God, we're doing this. Is everything ready to go? Oh my God. As soon as I press go here, as soon as I say the words, we are, this is it. 
and you're like, oh my God, if I feel like this, how are the athletes feeling? You know, so you kind of, it's, it's a symbiotic kind of, as a presenter, you feel the energy from the athletes as well. You, you feel it, you understand it. Um, and that's one of the things about the 70.3 as well is doing it in, in a couple of weeks is I kind of want to feel what it's like to be an athlete again and to feel the vibe on the ground and be like, you know, I hope that I help the athletes to feel like how I'm going to feel. And what would I have liked in the moment to help me get on the start line? And that's part of it as well. But yeah, it's it's been a, an amazing journey. And yeah, I can't wait to see what happens after Mallorca because that's all I'm concentrating on now. <laughs> <laughs> Not on a podcast. I have a podcast out next week myself. So um, yeah, so that's that's kind of it. And uh, the tri-suit or the two-piece suit fits. That was the big thing on Friday. Would the two-piece suit that hasn't been worn since 2017, would it tie? And it did. <laughs> Final question, because I know it was a perfect way segue to end the podcast. <laughs> Did you do every day of winter sea swimming without a suit? You're yeah. nuts. That was <laughs> <laughs> as my mother said, there was a drunk <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know. I did it as part of a challenge. Um, so we had started kind of sea swimming in COVID, and then there was a challenge. You had to swim 10k between uh November and March. I think I missed five days through not my that took completely out of my control. I think there was a couple of weather warnings and there might have been a funeral or something. So there was a couple of days where I couldn't get into the water over that five or six months period. But yeah, it was amazing. You know, it was super. Now, I'm I'm not in the water as much. and I'm a total wuss. It's 11 degrees at the moment and I wouldn't get in the water today because it's too cold. In a way. <laughs> and on that note, I suppose, <laughs> Joanne, thank you very much for coming on this week's episode of the podcast. It's been absolutely brilliant. But myself, Joanne and Eric, take care. Thanks so much, guys.